welcome you here to the uh, the Quadrus Centre. I'm actually absolutely delighted to uh, to welcome you all to South Tyneside, and especially a warm welcome to uh, Rachel Reeves, the MP for Leeds West, and who is the Shadow Secretary of State for Work and Pensions. I mean, it's it's uh, no surprise to anybody in this room that as a council we're committed to the social justice agenda and trying to bring real change to the lives of people in South Tyneside. Uh, bearing that in mind, we established the Independent Wage Commission in June last year to examine the benefits and challenges of adopting a living wage in South Tyneside. This September saw the publication of the Commission's report on the living wage and I would like to place on record our gratitude to Professor Keith Shaw of the Thumbia University who chaired the Commission and who sadly can't be with us today and his three colleagues who were on the Commission uh, Jeremy Cripps who was the Chief Executive of Ch Children's North East Neil Foster who is with us today from the Northern TUC and Martin Westgarth from the DUP, uh, DWP uh, Job Centre Plus they did some diligent work gathering evidence and compiling what is a compelling and very powerful report that sets out what we can do as an employer to lift more people out of low pay and support local families to live a better quality of life. And one way we can do that is the living wage. The living wage is good for families, good for business and good for society. So on the agenda this afternoon uh, we will hear from the, le the leader of the council, Councillor Ian Malcolm, Neil Foster from the TUC, who was a, a member of the Living Wage Commission, Janet Green, who is one of our employees, who will be affected by the issues that this report addresses, and from Rachel Reeves herself on what the next Labour government will do to address the issues of low pay. But first of all, can I welcome uh, Councillor Ian Malcolm, the leader of the council, onto the podium. We know that the, the difficulties that we have in South Tyneside in terms of representing our residents because of the unfairness of the government's financial regime. And we know that for all of the measures that we might put in place in terms of resilience and in terms of sure starts and children's centres and helping our local residents, it's only by strengthening our economic base that we're actually going to make a long-term difference. Which is why, Rachel, we've entered into a Sunderland City deal, which will, which will create 5,000 new jobs in the first phase, new high-skilled, high-wage jobs, just north of Miss Anne, just north of the driven in from Stockton South. In its first phase, 5,000 new jobs, creating anywhere up to 20,000 new jobs over the next 20 to 25 years. And that decision to create that city deal will be a significant in the future as a decision to bring Nissan to the North East was 30 years ago. Subject to council approval <coughs> in December, from April 2015 we will delete spinal column 5, 6, 7 and 8 so that one of our staff will be paid less than £7.11 per hour. This will mean in practice an immediate pay uplift of 67 pence per hour for some of our lowest paid workers. And then following that, we will be working during the course of 2015 to 16 with our trade union colleagues to implement the uh, a living wage in its entirety from April 2016, which will in effect mean that as an employer on South Tyneside, we will eliminate uh, low, low pay amongst our workforce. We don't really talk about pay a great deal in this country. I think we all plan up, we get very shy, very nervous, feel very awkward. But we have to, because it has such a big impact on so many different people's lives, both individually and collectively. It affects how many hours we have to work. We either we have to work two jobs, or in some cases three or even more. It's about whether you can afford that school trip for your children to go away somewhere. So whether you can actually save anything to put to one side for a rainy day or for an emergency. It has a big impact on your whether you can save, whether you can contribute towards a good pension, and also it has a big impact on the local economy. We either we have the ability not just to survive as a local area, but also to thrive as well. And I think probably most importantly, it's about dignity, about feeling that we're valued within society and in the workplace. So I think generally we have to talk about it a great deal, 
We're very uncomfortable about doing it, but this is why I think setting up a living wage commission was so important, so that somebody in South Tyneside was focused on this very issue. And so, you know, it is a real privilege to have been invited to be part of this commission, um, and I think the council deserves a great deal of credit for actually putting it on the horizon as well. I think that in these really difficult times, and it's a very difficult time for councils, particularly this council, given the scale of cuts it's experiencing, the question is, is can we afford to do something like this? But I think the view of the Commission was very much now is a time for more social justice, not less. And so I'm here as, as one of four commissioners um, who've been putting our minds to this issue for the last year. And all of us have a connection to South Tyneside. We care about uh, the borough, as do all of you. We were tasked with looking at a whole range of different aspects. The ethical reasons, the case for having a living wage, socio-economic impact, HR implications, what it would mean for the workforce, procurement and how council contracts could be affected. We heard from small firms in the borough, from unions including members of the workforce that would be affected, economic development officers and people involved in the regeneration of the towns in the borough. We heard from experts from a child poverty background and from the Living Wage Foundation and from the council's HR department looking at a number of practicalities too. We interviewed, we empathised, and at times I think it's fair to say we interrogated a whole range of people to try and see how we could actually get a living wage in South Townside. And it did challenge a lot of assumptions, but it also provided a great deal of insight and a number of personal stories that will stay with all of us um, through the course of the Commission. But here are just a few facts of things that stuck out to us. 1,000 people at the Council were paid below a living wage rate. But do you know what's scary? 95% of them were women. Huge, huge impact on women. Across the borough as a whole, beyond the council, including all people in work, one in four people were paid below a living wage. It's a real, real issue just for the, for the whole area, not just for the council. But on the positive side, whatever is spent locally gets circled around and has a lots of economic benefit, with 64p being generated on top of every pound spent uh, locally. But I think probably more than anything else, it's the sense of the grinding toll that low and poverty pay has on people's lives. And I think kind of we're all starting to accept now that there are huge numbers and growing numbers of people who are in work and yet also staggeringly find themselves in poverty. The Joseph Brownshee Foundation have proven that over half the people below the poverty line have someone in work in their household. And I think that goes against the grain of, of what any of us in this country want to see, and certainly in South Tyneside. And the impact that that has, the poor pay has on people's lives, um, we will discuss some of the practical examples of that uh, with Jan um, in a short while. But if you look at almost every issue of social policy, you can actually link it in some way to the consequences of stress, poor health, poor, poor pay and poverty. As a commission, we concluded and believed that fairer pay and a living wage would boost spending in the local economy. It isn't just the socially just thing to do, but it actually makes sense um, as part of the borough's economic development plans. It would reduce personal debt. This is not a case where people can't manage their money. They don't have enough money. It would improve family life a great deal and help tackle child poverty in a very direct way but it would also improve equality within the borough as well, giving a significant pay rise to many women working for the council. I think it would also boost self-esteem, people's self-worth, and that's something the Commission was very clear about when we've heard the testimonies from people. But I think, more than anything else, is isn't just about the pounds and pence. It's about giving people more choice, more freedom, and more time in their lives. And you can't put a price on that. As part of our recommendations, we were clear that we wanted to see the Council adopt a nationally recognised living wage rate and not come up with a very localised version um, that was separate to the very credible way that living wage is set. Obviously we wanted the Council to introduce it at the earliest opportunity they could. And I think it sounds quite a technical issue, but we didn't want the Council to go down the road of issuing it as a supplement, as a temporary top-up 
somehow to be sort of dispensed once a year, potentially with the uh, risk that it wouldn't be given uh, in some years. We wanted this to be seen as a permanent act of social and economic justice within the wage structure, rather than some act of charity. So that was a very, uh, very big element of our thinking, and something I'm delighted that the council has supported. And I think we were also very clear as a commission, we want this topic to engage the whole of the borough, not just in terms of, obviously, is it right to obviously pay people properly who work for your council or for your local area, but how can we lift the pay right across the private, the third sector, and other parts of the public sector too? Because South Times has a very cohesive borough, and if we do that, it can make a big, big impact too. And so we think there's still job work to be done, but it can involve many, many people, and it's not just the council's job as well. It has rightly been described as a historic moment for South Townside, committing to pay the living wage for the workforce. And phase one, to be introduced in April next year, will mean over 500 workers get an immediate and quite significant pay rise, with a total of 1,000 benefiting when the full living wage rate is eventually adopted hopefully the following year. These are really tough times and many people feel very insecure, very stressed, very concerned. We've seen on the banner, change is happening. Change is not always a good thing. Change can be frightening for a lot of people. This is a good, positive example of change that we're seeing from South Townside. But I think there is a degree of solidarity right across this borough. This is the right thing to do, and it's something we want to be building on in the months ahead. So um, thank you again very much for um, inviting me to be involved in this commission. I'm delighted we're here at this day with the council committing towards a living wage. Um, but I think probably most importantly, I'd like to invite Jan to join me up um, so we can have a quick chat and talk about the practical impact this is going to make. Thank you. So Jan is one of the people, she's one of the, uh, the people that we involved in the commission who works for South Townside Council and was one of our uh, people who talked about the impact it has, um, poverty pay, very low pay, has on people's lives, the consequences it has for them, for their families, and she could talk about the other people that she worked with as well. Um, so it was very, very powerful, and I think it's important that we kind of bring to life what this is all really about. Um, so Jan kind of can you just um, tell everybody how long you've worked at the council and what is it that you do? I've been back working for them for eight, eight and a half years now as a cleaner. And um, I started off doing a few hours and then um, my personal circumstances changed with my husband's ill health, which meant he could no longer work and I was the only person bringing any income into the house. I have two sons who I was supporting through college um, so I started working more hours because um, I don't want to claim benefits. I've never wanted to claim benefits. Um, I'm a fit, healthy person who can go out and work. So I get up for work at 4.30 on a morning and I go from one cleaning job to another cleaning job to make sure I can keep a roof over our heads, pay the bills and be debt free. And I'll continue doing it as long as I need to. So for this, for me, is massive because I'll not need to get out of bed at 4.30 every morning. Um, as you can tell, it's quite... It is big for me, it's massive. It's a quality of life for me. Um, for other people, it's money for repairs, the washing machine breaks down, a night out with a husband together, as opposed to, I'll go out this month, you can go out <coughs> next month. You know, you're not talking sort of like people want to go away and do all sorts. You're talking basic, everyday things. Buying the children something. A new pair of shoes for them without having to save up for months on end. Um, or without having to go into a charity shop to see what's been put in. As I go around work, I see lots of people. I work with lots of different cleaners in the different places I go to. And you hear it all the time. You know, I haven't got the money. I'm having, I'm robbing Peter to pay Paul. And this, this will make a massive, massive impact on all of their lives. Um, I'm not the only person in this position. And I think people don't realise how many it does affect. 
I mean, you, you obviously know a lot of people who obviously work at the council in a similar sort of situation as well. Um, what sort of difference do you think it will make? I mean, are, are peop I mean, people will be aware of the council's commitment towards it now and stuff. Um, is there a bit of a buzz around? What are people thinking? Are they? Um, it will make a difference, or is it going to be? A massive difference, a massive difference. Of course, the, the biggest question is when will I get it? How much am I going to get? <laughs> yeah. um, you know, it, it's it's a massive thing. But yes, everyone's it, it's. It takes away lots of pressure, it takes away lots of stress and everything because to some people £20 a month isn't, £20 a week isn't a lot. To other people it's a massive amount of money and it's the difference of living on the bread line mm. and having a little bit surplus. Um, you know, and like I say, £20 a week to some is nothing, but when you're on the bread line it's a massive amount of money. And it's going to make a big difference to people's families, isn't it, from what of you were saying? Of course it is. Of course it is. You know, um, the, the, the people with younger children can, can turn around and say, yes, you can go on that trip. You know, they don't have to be signalled out. They don't have to ring the, ring the school up and say, oh, they can't come in today, they're, they're poorly. Mm. Rather than feel the child feel as though they're being signalled out of not going somewhere with the school. Mm. They'll have the money to say, yes, I can, you can do that. And I don't think maybe we as a commission maybe kind of appreciated how in some situations it's having a b massive difference. So, I mean, one of your colleagues told us about how him and his partner were putting off starting a family as a result of not being able to afford That's to right. do it. And yeah. th these are huge life-changing kind of decisions which, you know, are being removed from people as a result of um, what they're paid, which... We're now rectifying. Well, that's it because, like, say, it's somebody who's working a 37-hour week um, on a minimum wage can't afford. They can't plan anything because they're stuck in that poverty trap. So this does mean they can plan ahead by knowing that they're going to be getting a living wage as opposed to a minimum wage. And again, I mean, you, you know, a lot of people um, in that same boat as you in the council. The council will get something positive back from this, won't it? The council will get the money spent back in the borough, but they'll also have a happier workforce. The workforce won't be um, going out elsewhere looking for alternative work. They'll be more loyal to the council because they're getting paid a wage that they can afford to live on. So, you know, they'll not be going and doing other jobs elsewhere or looking to be employed, which therefore has got to save the council training money on training or sick cover. Yeah, because I mean, you, you talked about people being happier as well yeah. and stuff, and there's obviously a big link to people's uh, happiness and well-being and the stress and sickness. I mean, there will be times where you'll know people who've been that worried, they've, they've gone ill, haven't they? Well, yes, because if you're, you know, when, when you're talking to people in the same year, you know, they can't afford this and they can't afford that, the children need this, um, you know, the pair of, pair of shoes, something for school, the stress, when the stress you know, they can't cope with things, so it's, I can't go to work because I can't do this. Um, the, and like I say, it, it's just, it's hard to describe the impact that it will have on people because it's a small amount of money in real terms that's going to make a massive impact on so many, so many people. Mm. And like I say, the money will be kept within the borough. So it's not where it's, it, the borough is finding the money, the council's finding the money to give them and they're going to go and spend it anywhere else. It's staying here, mm. you know, which in, in, of course has got to be better for here because it's causing more jobs. If there's more money to be spent, then people need to employ more people to take that money off them. And that's something that you want to see as well, isn't it? More people paying a living wage across South Town. I would so. love everybody to pay, to pay a living wage because I think nobody should have to go out and work for less than a living wage. Mm. It's wrong that people go to work and then have to have the wages topped up by benefits just so they can survive. But uh, here in South Tyneside, we've got a good story, uh, a clear commitment to supporting the living wage, and in a few months' time, um, more money in people's pockets. And that's a great thing. Brilliant. It's, I'm proud of being part of it, I really am. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jan, and, and everybody else who's kind of contributed, and I think kind of Jan sort of tells the story uh, far better than uh, I ever could. Okay, thank you very much.
one in five workers uh, across the country, I think one in four in the northeast, are paid less than a living wage, less than a wage that they can afford to support a basic standard of living, not the luxuries, as what Jan said, the basics for themselves and their families. And so the minimum wage is just that, it's a minimum. But we need to do more, we need to raise our ambitions higher and ensure that more workers are paid a living wage. Neil gave the statistics about the number of women affected by it. Now we know that when we introduced the minimum wage in 1999, two thirds of the people affected by that increase were women. And here in South Tyneside, 95% of the people who are going to be helping um, at the beginning of next year, early next year, are women. And we know that um, more women across the country are not paid a living wage than than men. And so this is also about an issue of an equality between men and women, as well as equality between the rich and the poor. All of the things I think people in this room came into politics and came into public life to achieve. So I'm incredibly proud to be here today with people of South Tyneside to celebrate this great achievement. Um, it was a year ago that I was last in South Tyneside, which is when this commission was launched, and Francis O'Grady, the General Secretary of the TUC, and myself were at a meeting at the Town Hall, uh, where we talked about the impact that a living wage could have. And in just a short space of time, in just a year, you've moved from it being an idea to being something that you've decided to implement. And that will make a huge difference to a thousand people but not just a thousand people, also all of their families and also the local businesses who will benefit from that extra spending power in the economy. And all the evidence shows that employers who introduce a living wage, it has benefits for them as well. Jan spoke about some of them. Uh, higher retention rate because people want to stay working for an employer who's paying them a decent wage. Lower rates of absence, uh, fewer people taking second jobs, greater loyalty uh, and greater productivity because people want to keep their jobs and they want to uh, do a good job because they feel that they are valued for doing the work they're doing. You're also going to see a lower turnover and therefore uh, lower costs in terms of uh, recruitment and training of staff. So it's also uh, good for you as an employer. Following the work of the Independent Living Wage Commission, our council is going to become the very first in the North East to introduce the living wage. Today's announcement shows that we are dedicated to protecting that all important link between work and security, work and dignity. That is what the living wage will mean to all those struggling to get by in our borough. It will give them the knowledge that they are working for more than survival and that their efforts go towards more than just putting the food on the table and putting the lights on. They will know that work in our community, that they work in a community that values them and <coughs> believes they are entitled to a decent life for the contribution that they make. The moral argument, as we have heard, is powerful on its own, but the Commission's report shows the practical benefits that a living wage can bring to our borough as well. As we've already heard today, it can reduce income inequality, it can boost economic activity in our area, and it can improve productivity. By doing all of this, it will be a fantastic achievement for our borough and make a huge difference to the lives of the people that we represent. I want to congratulate, finally, all of those who have worked on this important report and for their thorough work and careful consideration. I also want to thank everyone who's given evidence of the Commission's work and the Council officers who supported this process, as well as all the members of the public and campaigners who have contributed and campaigned tirelessly to the movement for a living wage. Today's commitment has the potential to transform the lives of people across South Tyneside. I am so proud to be here with you all today to acknowledge what is a victory for all of the working people in our area. Thank you very much.